Let us worship God. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Let every creature in heaven, on earth and under the sea, sing aloud to the one seated on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. every May. I'll tell you something else that happens every May for me. <laughs> I caught this from my mother and you're not going to catch it from me. It's allergies. Um, but we are delighted to have you here. Uh, Ellen is not here. Pastor Ellen um, is with Pastor Lynn. Uh, Davis is at Bryan East Hospital. He had surgery on Friday and was expected to be able to go home on Saturday, but um, he had uh, some complications on Saturday, and so he is now, I just got a text before this worship service that he has rallied and will be going home this afternoon. So we're grateful that, uh, uh, that uh, for that development for Ellen and Lynn. Uh, next week is Hostamania, a fundraiser for uh, the Loman trip, and there'll be hostas for sale at the east entrance. And Devin says, buy hostas. Buy hostas. <laughs> buy many hostas. Okay, we're also going to have, uh, on May 13th, 
senior, high school senior uh, recognition and a fruit and veggie reception following the 1030 service. Hey, last week we had a special week with uh, a special Sunday with the uh, luncheon and the auction of sons. And we were hoping that maybe we would surely raise enough for three or four panels or not three or four, not five, six panels. Now the panels are $665 each, the Lincoln Electrical System. Six times, you do the math. So it, it was, it was uh, a very successful uh, solar day for Westminster Church. Two weeks from now is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, and here to share a word about the Pentecost offering and what that does for young people at risk is Gary Howard. May 20th is Pentecost Sunday the birthday of the Christian church. The Pentecost offering unites us in a church-wide effort to support young people in Christ and inspire them to share their faith, their ideas, and their unique gifts with the church and with the world. Remember while giving this that 40% of the offering will stay with our own church to help develop and support programs for the youth. By using the special envelope that is in the pews, Please give generously to this worthwhile mission. And remember, please wear, wear red. Thank you. With full confidence in the love and mercy of God, let us confess together. Almighty God, you have lifted up our Lord Jesus from death into life eternal, setting him as Lord of all creation. We confess that our lives do not always reflect Christ alive within us, we have gone along with the destructive ways of the world. We have been careless of our neighbors. Forgive us and lift us up, that we may be a people. Praise the Lord Jesus and obey his commands as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, but it is Christ who reigns on high for us and who intercedes for us. So what could separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Nothing in all creation. So believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. Share Christ's peace. Let the children come forward for the children's conversation. It is so nice to see you this morning. It's kind of a fun day out, isn't it? I want to tell you a story about when I was about your age. My sister was a Girl Scout. I was too young to be a Girl Scout. And she got to go camping one weekend. Did you know I was so envious because I really, really, really wanted to go camping. And even though it poured outside that weekend and she came home a day early, totally drenched, and even though she was really sooty and smelled like smoke, I just still was so envious because I really had wanted to go camping. My mother had to sit down with me and tell me, you know, it's okay. Don't worry, someday it will be your turn, even though it is hard when you feel left behind. I know that probably some of you have felt left behind sometimes. I wonder if the disciples did on that day that, oh, well, let's see, Jesus, we know we go back to Easter when Jesus rose from the dead and he was with the disciples visiting them. And then today when he was visiting with them, he left and he rose up to heaven 
to be with God and to rule with God. And I wonder if the disciples felt left behind. They missed their friend, but they weren't left behind. The really wonderful thing about this was that though Jesus was up in heaven, he was still here with them, here with us, and that Jesus is with us always. Two places at once. Pretty interesting. But you know, before he went up to heaven, Jesus told the disciples, I want you to go out and share God's love with everybody. And that's what he wants us to do, too. Guess what? You are not too young. You, too, can go out and share God's love with everybody, just like Jesus would want us to. Shall we say a prayer? Lord God, thank you so much that Jesus is with us always. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Before you get up, I want to tell you that today, everybody from Faith Village and from Kindergarten of Eden gets to come downstairs with me to see a movie. All right? Okay. <laughs> Please come forward to re begin receiving our offering. God has showered us abundantly with all the gifts that we need to have our lives and calls us to share with the ministry of the church the gifts that the church needs to share the love of God in our world. So let us support the mission and ministry of Westminster Church through our tithes and offerings.
pray. Lord God, we offer before you these gifts and dedicate them as tokens of our lives that we ourselves may be dedicated to the purpose of sharing Christ's love with our neighbors on earth. For we pray it in his name. Amen. For most of the 38 years that I've been a pastor, I've uh, used the lessons for Ascension Day on the Sunday preceding Ascension Day because, well, Ascension always falls on a Thursday and you don't really get Presbyterians out on Thursdays to come to an Ascension Day service. Although with Marathon Day, it's just about as bleak. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, these are lessons for the Ascension. First from Acts 1. Listen for God's word. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. And from the Gospel of John, these words from Jesus' farewell address. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned, I am coming to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you. Sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation within each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You've seen those bumper stickers, I know you have, illustrated with an image <clears throat> of a gray-faced, bug-eyed visitor from another planet. And the caption is, we are not alone. The reportings of such phenomena as flying saucers and alien abductions seem to go up dramatically when in the course of our long human history we became capable in the 1940s of rocket propulsion. Probably not a coincidence. Until Galileo and Copernicus, earthlings believed that we were, or rather that the earth, was the center of the universe and the whole created order. Oh, they were wrong. And until about 100 years ago, 1920, when astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that the Milky Way was not the only galaxy, we thought we were the only galaxy. But there are billions of galaxies. There wasn't even a plural for galaxy until 1920. The universe is infinitely larger than anyone who lived and thought before 1920 could possibly have imagined. Now, I don't know what to make of abductions by little gray men, although when I was a child, they were supposed to be little green men. I don't know what happened to that. Anyway. But it is nevertheless fascinating to consider that our Creator may have made worlds far beyond our own that are hospitable to life. Scientists believe that if there are intelligent beings beyond our solar system, our first evidence would probably be in the form of a radio wave signal rather than in a hovercraft. But we live our lives in this little orb on the edge of one modest-sized galaxy, and we really wonder, can it be that we are the only creatures with thought in this vast array of galaxies and all their stars and planets, are we alone? In one sense, the question of whether we are alone is a mighty strange one, coming from someone who shares an increasingly crowded planet with seven billion other human beings. But nevertheless, at a very fundamental level, for our grasp on the purpose of life and our place in God's creation, it is one of the things we have to ask. It's one of the things that infants must discover, a discovery that's made long before they have the words to express it. But you see, if an infant is left alone, even if the bodily needs of the infant are met in some perfunctorily cold manner, like a robot arm offering a bottle for food and someone perfunctorily cleansing the infant as needed, the infant will not thrive under those conditions, but could die from the simple deprivation of feeling alone. Research indicates that parents cannot substitute so-called scheduled quality time with a child for the sheer quantity of time. Research shows that even if a parent is busy with other tasks in the home, cooking, cleaning, sweeping the garage, there is something that a child gains from mom or dad simply being there. Kind of sounds like the way kids used to be raised on the farms of America. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. It's crucial to us to know that we are not alone. And it's crucial to our sense of who we are in God's world. So imagine, then, for a moment, if you will, that you are one of the disciples of Jesus. 
and you'd walked along those dusty roads of Galilee with him, and you had rode on the Sea of Galilee with him, and you had traveled down to Jerusalem with him, and you had watched him die horribly on a cross at Golgotha, and you were one of the first to hear the incredible word that he wasn't dead but risen again. And now you learn that this Jesus, who's so important to you, who is so central in your life, who has given life meaning, is leaving for good. The various accounts of the New Testament are not completely harmonious about when the risen Christ no longer appeared to the early disciples. Brother Luke, in his gospel and in Acts, makes that a round figure of 40 days, and that's reflected in our church calendar to this day. But if you look in John's gospel, it doesn't mention a time frame for this departure. There's agreement in the text, however, that Jesus could no longer physically be present and that he was taken up into heaven. Now, if you've had any astronomy science in school, and living in the 21st century as we do, you know that there's a problem with the word up. Because up and down are relative terms when you live on a round planet. Uh, what's up here in Nebraska is not the same direction as what is up in New Zealand, right? Um, the concept for first century Christians is that we were living on a, <clears throat> a flat earth. Well, oh, it wasn't flat like a pancake because you could see mountains on it. And there's this dome of the sky above it. And so when Jesus went up, he went up from here up to there. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can accept the theological meaning of the ascension without trying to adopt the mistaken astronomy of the first century A.D. The ascension theologically means that Jesus is now in a realm apart from the world and apart from time and space as we know it. In our readings from John's Gospel today, we get a picture of Jesus concerned with explaining to his disciples what will happen to them when he leaves. It's apparent that Jesus realized that his friends were probably going to feel rather overwhelmed by it all. So he says, I will not leave you orphaned. Now, when you look at uh, ancient rabbinical literature, you discover that uh, when ancient Jewish rabbis died, their disciples, their learners, were said to be orphaned. And if you look at ancient Greek literature, you discover that the disciples of Socrates, when he died, were said to be orphaned. It was a common figure of speech. But can you feel the desperate aloneness of an orphan? And some of you may have experienced it as a tragedy within your own life. But Jesus prepares his disciples by showing them that though he will not be physically present with them, he will continue to be among them and they would not be alone. First, the ascension would mean the promise of God's spirit to be with us. Jesus told them what must have seemed to be uh, an incredibly obtuse statement when he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. My advantage? Really? But the advantage is the Holy Spirit, the continuing presence of the Lord as advocate and counselor. Through the Spirit, Christ can be present with every believer and every community of believers every time and all the time, something that Jesus could not do in his physical earthly ministry. So it is, yes, to our advantage. Secondly, because the church itself is a creation of the Spirit, the birth of which, as Gary pointed out, we will celebrate in two weeks hence on Pentecost. So through the church, Christ continues to have a visible presence in the world. We are what the world sees, and that is the body of Christ, and that's what the New Testament calls the church, the body of Christ, the visible presence of Christ in the world. So when we are present as Christians with someone who is alone or someone who is sick or someone who is bereaved, we are Christ's presence for that person. Sometimes we may not know what to say when we go to someone who is in 
the pain of one of life's tragedies, mostly we don't need to know what to say. It is enough simply to be there, to be present on Christ's behalf. The presence of Christ by the Spirit is not granted merely to individuals who claim faith, but is found primarily in the community of faith. Jesus, you know, once told his disciples, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Now, the church, we've misused that, um, that statement of Jesus over the years. We made it into a proof text to console ourselves on days like Marathon Sunday when we don't have a very big crowd. Well, where two or three are gathered, you know, Christ is there in the midst of them. That's not what he meant. It wasn't a matter of two or three versus a thousand. And since we don't have a thousand, we're okay because Jesus is still here. No. What he meant was two, on the one hand, two or three or a hundred or five hundred or ten thousand versus, on the other hand, one. That's the contrast. Plural, singular. And this Christian faith is essentially a group project where people, not person, but people are gathered in Christ's name. Thirdly, the ascension emphasizes the lordship of Christ over all creation. In the exaltation of Jesus to heaven's high throne, God shows that the one of lowly birth in Bethlehem is the eternal word who created all things. Through him all things were made and nothing was made that, without him that was made, according to John 1. In the ascension, Christ shares again in the omnipresence and omnipotence of God. Omnipresence, fancy word, means everywhere present. Omnipotence, another fancy word meaning all-powerful. So it is that the epistle of Paul to Christians at Colossae includes an ancient affirmation of the early church in the form of a hymn to the exalted, ascended Christ. Paul wrote, He's in the, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And then I love this awesome line, in, thing, in him all things hold together. So the ascension of Christ means that our Lord is not merely above us and around us and within us, but moment by moment the very fabric of the creation in which we dwell is holding together because of the presence of the eternal word in Christ. The awe of the psalmist at the omnipresence of God is expressed in Psalm 139. Where can I go away from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in the underworld, thou art there. If I take wings and fly to the far reaches of morning or dwell at the uttermost part of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me. So friends, are we alone in the universe? Not on your life. We're not orphans. Christ is with us today. And every day. Amen.
My friends, we have gathered before the Lord's table. According to the evangelist Luke, people will come from east and west and sit at, and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust in him to share in the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right in our bounden duty, Lord God Almighty, to offer you our thanksgiving and praise wherever your glory dwells. You are great and awesome. You made this world and all the things in it, everything that we need to sustain our daily lives. Mighty are you, and holy is your name. But your greatest gift of all was when you sent your only begotten Son, the eternal Word, to become human flesh and to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. He reached out to heal the sick and befriend sinners. And obeying you, he went to the cross. And there at Golgotha suffered on behalf of the sins of of the world to save us and redeem us. We thank you that he is not dead, but has risen to rule the world and is still the friend of sinners, and that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Now, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of field and vineyard, that they may be a participation for us in the effects of Christ's sacrifice at Calvary for us. And unite us with all the baptized throughout the world who praise your name and who pray the words with us that Jesus teaches all of his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do this according to Christ's example and his appointment. For on the night of his arrest, our Savior took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same manner, our Savior took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the New Testament, sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do this remembering me. For whenever we eat of this bread or drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Hallelujah, let us keep the feast.
before the prayers of the community, let me share that Deb Eastman's mother, Carolyn Eastman, passed away. Kate Swanson's mother, Mary Hancock, passed away. Mary was a parishioner of mine for 31 years in Beatrice. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you in the greatness of your love and lift up our hearts in prayer and praise. We thank you that the way to your presence is always open through Jesus Christ, our ascended Lord, that you invite us to draw near in full assurance of faith. We thank you that he promised that we would not be left alone, that the Advocate, the Spirit, would be with us to the end of the age. So help us to pray sincerely and gratefully, remembering the needs of others as well as our own and giving thanks always for everything in the name of Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh God, we pray for a blessing to rest upon this congregation, Westminster Church. We're grateful for its worship and fellowship, for its care and teaching of children and young people, for its nurture, its love. And in a time of transition, help us to become the kind of church you need today. May we not lose sight of the varied needs of our community. And we pray for the wider church as well. Uphold before us a vision of your kingdom, a vision of justice, mercy, truth, and compassion. We pray especially for our fellow Christians in South Sudan who face so many trials. And we remember all those young people who are finishing the semester at school, those who have or are about to graduate from high schools and colleges, praying that their efforts will be justly rewarded, that they will achieve what is necessary to move forward along their chosen path. We pray for people who are afraid today because of illness. Reassure them that because of the knowledge that you have given to us, so many diseases can all be cured. Help them to have confidence with those who have medical knowledge and give them courage, hope, and peace, and the knowledge that you are present in weakness, pain, and suffering. Lord, we pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them. Help us to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the church family around us until once more we are reunited with all your saints in your heavenly kingdom. For we entrust all our concerns to God in the name of Christ, amen.
and Christ there at our end. Christ be in our journey, Christ everlasting friend. Christ be in our waking, Christ at our repose. Christ in every action, Christ when eyelids close. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the blessing and fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all. Amen.